Good afternoon, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Um, it'd be really nice if uh, if we could meet in person, but uh, you know, given the circumstance, I think this is the best we can do at this point. And this has at least actually a lot to do with the, the, the capability that we can meet here like this over the network has a lot to do with the um, theme of today's talk. Now, before I start um, you know, the, the talk, I would like to introduce a special guest today that uh, who's been you know, up for a long, long time through the late night uh, from South Korea. Um, there is um, a you know, journalist from South Korea and, and you know, South Korean online uh, science newspaper um, who has joined um, this particular um, uh, lecture. Um, uh, um, the <clears throat> uh, Kilgidanim, could you turn on your camera so that I can introduce you? Um, so she's, uh, she's not, she's in there, but I don't know who she is. <laughs> when she get a chance, she can, she can do that. All right. So before, so, um, you know, uh, let me just start my lecture. So uh, today I'm, I'm going to talk about the high throughput grid computing. Um, you know, sometimes it's called high performance grid computing. Uh, and I will then, you know, what's the relationship between, you know, it and the high energy particle physics. And, and it actually came out of the uh, need for high energy particle physics. Uh, my name is Jae-hoon Yu. It's a little hard to pronounce. I go by J-U. I'm from University of Texas at Arlington. I'm a professor at that university. Here is the outline of my talk. I'm going to talk about who I am so that you can see where I'm coming from and why I'm coming from and why I have that kind of interpretation of what we do <clears throat> and how I'm related to ASP. And, you know, but the biggest thing is uh, SKTB, but, uh, but you know, I can tell you what, uh, what my relationship is. And then I go and talk about the introduction, introduce uh, the talk and high energy physics to you guys and, and show you what the problem is and why we were, you know, that caused this kind of technology to be developed. And then the solution, which is, uh, which look, which we have uh, found through the computing grid and the implementation of it and what high, you know, high throughput computing did for the Nobel, uh, for a Nobel winning discovery of the Higgs particle. And I conclude. Now, you know, the title is like this, but this actually has to do with a lot to do with their impact to the society. And it's got to do with my 1000 year dreams. So my primary, you know, talk is going to be what are we doing with this particular, you know, physics area of physics and why we are doing it. And that's, that's the, you know, primary theme of today's talk. So let me just start out with who I am. Um, I, you know, again, here is my name, and uh, I lived in South Korea through 1987 under military dictatorships. I put S in there because there was a continuous military dictatorship, and I know a lot of countries are like that as well at this point. And so that, you know, I take freedom and democracy and fundamental human decency very seriously. And this is one of the reasons why I was at the, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter protest in Arlington last year during the pandemic. And this is a photograph of me with maybe about 3000 people participating in that. And I obtained my bachelor's degree in military, uh, the, uh, the master's uh, degree in, in physics in South Korea and did a compulsory military service in, in the Korean army before I was able to get out of the country. And I joined a PhD program at Stony Brook University in New York in 1987, which is not far from where, you know, Brookhaven is, which, you know, Katebi works, and uh, obtained a PhD in 1993 in high energy physics. And my PhD thesis was something called the zero experiment, which, you know, I participated in prototyping, beam testing, construction, assembly, commissioning, data taking, data analysis, collider data analysis and thesis writing and publication of the thesis, the entire process. So I was one of the lucky you know, generation of uh, PhD students who was able to go through the entire process starting from construction of detector. So here is a, you know, uh, the D0 central calorimeter with, where I actually contributed uh, taking part in uh, assembling this thing together starting from you know um, building these small modules as well here is me 
And, uh, and you know, I, I, all my three children were born during this period when I was doing my PhD. So it was, uh, it was difficult for me um, at that time and for my family to do this. And they're all two years apart from each other and they're all grown up and they're not at home anymore. <clears throat> And then I did my first uh, first postdoc at the Jura with the University of Rochester for about two and a half, three years, followed by the second postdoc at Fermilab, 96 to 90, 98, um, and uh, on neutrino experiment. This is a time that I actually did a lot of work passionately um, you know, on this neutrino experiment. And, you know, and at that time I built the calibration beam line and ran calibration program and published that, uh, that data that we have taken the data with. And this is a time that I have learned all the beam related technology and beam related techniques that I need to learn at that time. And then I became Femilab uh, staff scientist, 98 through uh, 21, uh, 2001, and led, you know, I was the commissioning coordinator for the D0 upgrade, which I did my, um, you know, my degree there. And, uh, and then I became the professor at uh, U University of Texas at Arlington, 2001 through, uh, through now. I'm a full professor. And this is, uh, these are all the things that I have done. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing. There is a TV interview, that, uh, the live TV interview that I've done in my life, first time in my life, and, uh, and hopefully not the last time. But uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through that at this point. If you want, I can post it so that you can watch it as well. Okay, but right now I am leading the conceptual design of the second 17,000 ton liquid argon modules, high voltage system uh, for the dune detector that I'll be talking about later. So now this is a, this is a photograph of the prototype detector that I had built at, uh, at CERN. Uh, I was responsible for field cage construction. This is called field cage here. That's six meters by six meters by six meters cube. Um, and I was the, uh, you know, we're the only U.S. university to take part in this uh, particular construction. Um, and uh, this is a Femilab official poster. And this photo has been used in many mass media worldwide, including, you know, a paper and a newspaper in Switzerland as well. So how am I related to ASP? Um, I organized the first high performance computing program in, uh, in ASP uh, 2012 in, in Ghana. So that was uh, the second ASP. And you know, I secured funding through uh, US National Science Foundation. I serve, I'm serving as an international advisory committee member to this school um, and you know, continuously securing funds for lecturer and students uh, support uh, with the US uh, National Science Foundation. And you know, I'm I'm you know planning on doing that for the for the foreseeable future. I have I was able to arrange an additional funding from South Korea for 2014 school, which you know unfortunately didn't continue. But I hope that uh, with the help of um, of our journalist here, we could actually get uh, South Koreans get involved in again. And uh, and I've been working hard to open PhD opportunities for ASP graduate students. Um, so Dr. Las Faramenga, who is uh, my student, uh, who did the PhD, obtained PhD in 2016, and he is the first um, you know um, graduate uh, of the first ASP in 2010. So here is Dr. Faramenga. And uh, he's, uh, he's now working at a uh, Wells Fargo, with a very big uh, finance institutions in the US in the DFW area, Dal Dallas Fort Worth area near where we are. And this is a photograph of him and his wife and his first son uh, visiting me just before the shutdown last year, um, you know, pandemic shutdown. And this is the area that we, uh, we are building our, our you know, detector. And then the second was uh, Bright, uh, Bright Izudike, um, who is a 2012 grad and uh, obtained a master's degree in 2015. And uh, here he is, and he's, uh, his, his, he has been working as a software engineer, uh, starting out with the US Air Force, and, uh, and now he's working at a, a private company around this area. The last one is, uh, and most recent, was Mohammed uh, Abdel Razek, uh, and uh, he's a 2020 ASB graduate. Um, although, you know, I, I was uh, not able to um, sort of attract him to our university, he's, uh, he's actually a student starting his work at the uh, 
Southern Methodist University, which is not too far from where, where I am now. So, you know, I would like to make sure that uh, many of you guys can actually come and work in the US if possible. Of course, there are other opportunities in other countries, but, you know, come and, and work with us so that uh, you guys can, can, you know, make um, lives of the human beings much better. So let me just start out with, uh, with the main part of the, um, of the talk. Uh, so what's the high energy, you know, particle physics? Uh, so sometimes you write it as HEP, and that's uh, high, high energy physics short, in short. The in the elevator talk, I would say, it's a subfield of physics that uh, tries to understand what makes up the universe and what the fundamental forces between them. So if there are fundamental particles and they, we can find what the, the forces between them and we understand them better, then, then you know, we can actually try to see how the universe is made and what we can make it better. So known forces, as you know, are gravitational force, electromagnetic force, weak nuclear force, and strong nuclear force. These are known fundamental forces. And electromagnetic force and weak nuclear force, we found that they are actually combined together as one. So sometimes, you know, they say there are three fundamental forces, uh, electroweak force, as we call them. And the current theory is a group theory called the standard model of particle physics. This has been out there for over half a century and we've been trying to prove, well, we've been trying to see experimentally, um, you know, if the description that the standard model gives us uh, is, is, is right. But to me, one of the most important thing, most important thing that I ask you to do, uh, and no matter what you do, <clears throat> is to ask yourselves why why we're doing it and, and what are we trying to accomplish doing this and how can we do, how can we accomplish with that, um, with, with what we want to accomplish and ask these questions in the sense of the fundamental humanity. And that's the important part that I want to message, important message I want to deliver to you. So if you were to think about, um, you know, this is the periodic table of elements. There are a huge number of these atomic elements and, and you know, and it's, we are actually increasing the finding even more and we can even make unstable, um, you know, nuclear elements, you know, over and over again. Okay, but that's, this is telling you that this is just too complicated. This cannot be the fundamental particles. At the very beginning of the 20th century, well, late 19th and, and early 20th century, we thought these were actually fundamentals, but that's not actually fundamental. What we have found in the high energy physics and standard model is that the universe is made of these fundamental particles, much, much simpler picture as you can see. So a total of 16 particles, 12 particles plus four different kinds of force mediators. So here are 12 particles of three families and then force mediators. And these guys, of course, there are many different types, but there are four different types of force mediators that make all the visible matter in the universe. So the key word here is the visible matter in the universe. So if you look at this, compare this with the previous picture that I showed you. It makes so much simpler. It makes so much sense. And that's not even that. I mean, if you think about it, and this is uh, this this picture has been tested to a precision of one part per million, and we've been you know improving our systematics, our you know uncertainties much much better, and the measurement as well. Now, as we understand, these three particles here, so the top quark and the bottom quark, up quark and the down quark, and the uh, and the electrons make up most of the ordinary matters that you see that's, uh, that are stable. And these guys have mass of about 10% of the proton mass. Okay, so these are making up the protons, okay? And then of course, there are other particles that we have found. And this last quark, the top quark was found in 1995. So if you think about it, it's, it's only about 20 years old that we have completed you know this this particular picture not and and you know this particular particle has a mass of 175 times the proton mass i mean look at this there are six quarks here and these six quarks go from 10 percent of the proton mass to 175 times the proton mass they are fundamental particles so therefore it's a little you know, fishy. I mean, it just doesn't seem to make too much sense why are they why are the masses are spread so much. 
And of course, this particular particle, the Higgs particle, which sometimes dubbed as the God particle, um, which is the evidence of the, uh, the mechanism that give masses to all these fundamental particles, was discovered in 2012. Now, we are having a very interesting revolution in terms of understanding the fundamental particles. These are called neutrinos. And these, you know, in the standard model, the masses of all these neutral, charged neutral particles are supposed to be zero in the standard model, despite the fact that all the other guys have masses. And, but we have found that these guys' masses are non-zero. What does it tell you? That means that the standard model is somehow broken as it is, it requires fixes, okay? So what are some of the issues in high energy particle physics? I mean, you know, we've tested this, this model, you know, to, uh, to one part better than one part per million, but then, you know, there, it's not good enough because we are seeing the mass range so large, you know, why are the fundamental masses going from 10% to 175 times the mass? And we call that mass hierarchy problem. And it's the particle discovered at the LHC in 2012, the real Higgs particle that the standard model says it is. And of course, it's you know becoming more and more and getting you know behaving closer and closer to the um, uh, to the standard model Higgs particle based on the measurement. And why is the matter in the universe made only of particles? I mean, you know, if you guys uh, see yourselves, you guys are made of particles and it's a good thing because you guys are made of particles. Imagine if you're walking down the street and you see your anti, anti you and anti you come and hug you, then, then what happens then? You become in turn to, you know, um, blob of energy, right? And then of course, neutrinos have mass because standard model says it doesn't, therefore the standard model is broken and it requires fixes. But then of course, you know, we have to do a precision measurement test. What are the properties of neutrinos and uh, you know, such as masses? And what are the particle and antiparticle? You know, are there any particle antiparticle asymmetry in neutrinos just like we see in everyday universe matter? And why are there only four apparent forces or three sometimes, right? So, um, you know, were they all unified at, at the Big Bang, at the beginning of the universe, which makes perfect sense because at the Big Bang, if you can imagine, everything in the universe is, you know, combined into a very small invisible point. Therefore, the energy density is very high and you can imagine all these all forces can be, you know, unified into one. We're not talking about this Big Bang Theory. I don't know if you guys know this Big Bang Theory. <laughs> And, uh, you know, myself is, uh, I, I call myself this guy right here. I mean, you know, who's, uh, who's more reasonable. Okay, but, uh, you know, the, the, we, have, we then ask what question here? So if all the forces are unified at the beginning of the universe, then what can we do with it? What is it good for us? So here is, uh, you know, uh, here is an example of, um, of how we do this, right? So how does a nuclear power plant work? I don't know if uh, any of you guys are nuclear you know, engineer, but you know, here is how a nuclear power plant works. So you have an area where you create, you know, break the nucleus. And so you use the quantum mechanical you know, um, ideas that you break the nucleus, that the nucleus then give us the energy and you then capture the energy with the, um, you know, by boiling the water and generating steam. And steam goes and turns the turbine, which then in, in the end turns the generator and give the electricity to the city. To the uh, to to people. Now, if you look at this, then this seems to be so arcane, right? The um, energy generation is is quantum mechanical, but then energy capturing is just a simple steam engine. So that's one of the reasons why it's so complicated and so unsafe. Now, if all the forces are combined into one, we don't have to go and capture energy like this. We can go directly from here to the electricity. Somehow, I don't know how to do it, but somehow, if we, we know, we can prove that all these forces are unified into one and we generate that kind of condition. So one of my 1000 year dreams is skip the whole thing and go directly into the electricity. You can make electricity directly from nuclear forces. Imagine what you can do if you can do it, right? So suppose you can have, you can have these small, very small nuclear reactor in your car. 
and uh, and you know you don't even have to you know charge the car or fuel the car anymore and you can actually build your house at the, on top of himalayas and be be you know stand alone by yourself okay and it could be lasting forever so that's one of the things we could do now of course the next thing next question is the picture that we you know picture of the universe we present the real thing we think that the universe is made of like this. So here is the universe pi, and only about four to five percent of the matter is the normal visible matter. In other words, that uh, that standard model can describe these guys. But then, of course, we know that you know early uh, 1900s um, that we know that the uh, there are you know, dark matter, the matter that we can't see, but that provides the mass in the universe to keep the universe together. And of course, in 1980s, we found that uh, there were you know a lot more energy that's lurking around in the universe. What does it tell you? It tells you about 95 percent of the things in the universe we have no idea. We don't know. We just know they exist, but we have no idea what they are, the properties of them, and how they work. So imagine what we can do if we can find these guys. If we can say, you know, we can make the dark matter and we can study the heck out of them and use them <clears throat> for our everyday lives. That, that will make the lives much better, right? So then, of course, the next thing is that are there any, any other particles that we don't know of, which is, you know, the uh, new LHC runs that are looking into and, you know, how do we, you know, where do we all come from? And this is the fundamental scientific but spiritual question as well. So we're trying to do understand the fundamentals of the universe because we want to know where we all came from. But most important and are an overarching um, uh, question that we have to ask is that how can we live well in the universe as an integral partner of the universe, not the destroyer of the universe? I see, you know, I despise of those who think that uh, because the God gave us this, we have to, we can abuse them. Well, since God gave us this, we should use them in a, and, and keep them safe and, and use them you know, wisely. So in order for us to do that, we use accelerators. So we accelerators are powerful microscopes. So suppose you want to see what you want to, you know, you want to see. So here is a, well, let me see. So here is a, hang on a second. There you go. Here is my, you know, um, the uh, headset. And and you know, if you want to see what's inside a headset, what do you do? You break them, right? I mean, you know, I would throw it on the floor and break them, and uh, and then you can have a small pieces, right? Then you can see ah. This is how it looks like. But if you want to see even smaller than what you do, you take a hammer and hit it again. You make it break it into smaller pieces. Then, then if you want to see even smaller, then what do you do? You take a big hammer and hit it even harder. What are you doing? By doing that, you're actually increasing the kinetic energy of the stuff that you're trying to probe um, what you're trying to absorb. We do exactly the same thing, but quantum mechanical way. So we, we use you accelerate particles so that they have uh, large energy, large kinetic energy. And as the kinetic you know, energy increases, if you're, if you're looking at it in a you know, low energy beam, they may look like this, which is a event. But then if you're seeing it in the high energy beams, then it could look like that, even smaller areas. So as the energy goes up, you can probe even smaller and smaller. And of course, what does that mean? That means we can actually generate the particles that didn't exist, that does not exist now, but that exists a long time ago. And it's based on the you know, famous formula of E equals MC squared from uh, you know, Einstein. So it says if you have particles and antiparticles beams collide like this at the, like, you know, in the LHC, then you're, these particles and antiparticles uh, you know, annihilate from, with each other and they become a blob of energy. But when they become a blob of energy, they can then turn into mass. So this E equals MC squared is not just from left to right. It also works right to left. In other words, if you have energy, then you should be able to generate mass as long as energy conservation is satisfied. And that's what the idea is. So if you then use particle accelerators, you can generate all these particles that don't exist anymore because we are generating and annihilating them into a blob of energy. And so there are two you know, uh, big labs, one in the US and Fermilab uh, and, and one in, the, um, uh, at, in Europe at CERN. And now I'm having trouble of um, 
Okay, there you go. So, um, you know, word, the, the, so femoral tabatron is world largest uh, proton antiproton collider was, it doesn't work anymore at four kilometers, um, you know, in, in circumference, which is two and a half miles. Here is a photograph and it's near Chicago, about 40 miles west of Chicago. Uh, 40 miles, but 60 kilometers west of Chicago. The, um, uh, the energy of this thing that it can give is two tera electron volt. Doesn't give you a good feel, does it? And, uh, and you know, total energy that it can give is 13 mega uh, million, 13 million joules on the area smaller than one square centimeter. So you can imagine how much density, you know, energy density we're talking about. And the energy of 13 megajoules is the same as the kinetic energy of a 20 ton truck running at the speed of 130 kilometers an hour. You can imagine if you go on the highway and you see this big truck uh, speeding at 130 kilometers an hour, how do you feel? You feel the kinetic energy right off, right? And the density of this energy is 100,000 times the energy density at the ground zero of, you know, the atomic bomb that ended the, um, the Second World War, right? The Hiroshima atomic bomb. In other words, the point where the explosion occurred and the energy density is highest there, but this energy density is even 100,000 times higher than that. So you can imagine how much energy density we are talking about. This tabatron was shut down in 2020, 2011 to, uh, to hand over the baton to LHC because LHC was turning on. But the new frontiers with high intensity proton beams, you know, they're increasing in intensity really, really high. Um, and, and this is one of the food for thoughts calculations that I'm giving you at the end of this lecture. Uh, and it's uh, this beam, including the search for dark matter um, with a beam is happening here in, in the US lab. And, um, and the LSC is the world highest energy proton proton collider, right? So the difference is a proton antiproton versus proton proton collider, 27 kilometer circumference, 100 meter underground. So you, if you look down, it's a little scary. The energy, you know, design energy is 14 tera electron volts, which is 362 mega joules. Kinetic, the equivalent to the kinetic energy of the Boeing 727, which is an 80 ton plane with, uh, with a speed of 310 kilometers, uh, uh, kilometers per hour and 3 million times the energy density. This has covered a new heavy particle that looks just like Higgs and behaves just like Higgs so far and in 2012. And you know, search for new particles have been ongoing, has been ongoing. The LHC has, uh, has been shut down since 2018 to, uh, to upgrade it. And now it's starting back up, uh, you know, they're starting this year um, for high, you know, high intensity runs. This is the experiment that I was involved in. But you know, CMS is just as big of an experiment. Now, so here is the photograph, aerial photograph of LSC and, and CERN. I mean, this is just a perimeter and uh, then silhouette of the accelerator, but at 100 meter underground. So here is Geneva Airport, Switzerland, France, and here is here is Atlas CMS in France somewhere. And this was, you know, actually uh, covered in, um, well, actually uh, appeared in the movie um, and the book called uh, Angels and Demons. And I, I suggest you to watch that movie, although it was a pretty old movie compared to, um, it's about 10 years old. So now these, um, you know, accelerator is one thing, but the accelerator will give you the signatures and the ideas of how these, you know, structure of the matter looks like. But then we have to have detectors, uh, you know, like the photograph, the, the camera to catch the events and so that we can study. These, each of these detectors, you can see that how big this is, right? So here is a person and here is a person here. This is a CMS detector, this is an Atlas detector. Each one weighs about 7,000 tons and 10 story tall and records huge number of collisions per second, you know, out of 50 million. And uh, that's the number of collisions possible and records approximately about 350 megabytes per second. It'll be even higher as, uh, as we go into the higher uh, lumina, uh, the um, uh, beam intensity and records two petabytes per year. And it's gonna, it's gonna be about 10 times higher than that as we you know, take data in, in the coming years, which is 200 times the printed material in the US Library of Congress. If you have any chance to come to the US, I suggest to go and see how you know, this library looks like. It's just completely entire building, completely full of books. 
Now that's the LHC experiments. The next big thing that is going to be built, it's not completely built yet, it's on the design stage, it's called DUNE, which stands for Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. I told you guys about the, the, the modification that we need to do in the standard model for the neutrinos, right? So that's an important thing because it's an earth-shaking and groundbreaking discovery if we were to um, actually measure the neutrino masses properly. It's a $2.3 billion US flagship uh, long baseline and the baseline is 1300 kilometers. So you, beam, you shoot the beam 1300 kilometers away and detect it at 30 kilo, 1300 kilometers away. It's 1500 meter underground in South Dakota in the US. So here is how, what the components looks like. This is on Framilab site. You take the proton beam and shoot him into the target and target then generates the secondary particles and those secondary particles decay and turn into neutrinos. And neutrinos are, do not like to interact so much that, so they can just go right through the earth. Earth, and so go from Femilab here to 1300 kilometers away in South Dakota. And in the, and 1500 meter underground, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an abandoned gold mine. You can actually, you have, you will have an, an experimental area like this. There will be four different cabins that each one, a total of 80,000 tons of liquid argon total that we can hold like this. And one of these guys look like this. So it's, uh, it's the detector and it holds the liquid argon, which is at the cryogenic temperature, uh, about minus 200 degrees Celsius. And at 66 meters long, 15 meters tall and 15 meters wide. So this is a, a giant building and we're, we're putting the detector inside of this. And of course, in order for us to do that, we have to build a prototype detector. And here is an event, um, you know, the, the liquid argon, time projection chamber, we call. And this is the proto prototype detector um, you know, track of the events that, uh, that of, a, of a muon beam that are coming in and interacting inside of the detector. It's a beautiful you know, picture that it can provide you. These are nuclear interactions that you can see in the liquid argon where the particles come in and hit the nucleus of the liquid argon, break them apart. You can see that they are actually breaking apart in here. Okay, so it provides a beautiful thing. But then of course you have to record the data. So here is, uh, here is an example. So you have proton, proton, a proton, antiproton, it doesn't matter. You collide and you have the data coming out and you make the digital signal out of these detector and you record the digital data into the tape. Uh, and you know, I think we're gonna be going, continue doing into tape because that provides a you know, more stable data um, medium. And then of course we take that data and re, uh, you know, reconstruct, you know, to record, reconstruct the picture as you saw before uh, in this large computing farm. And it's even you know, increasingly larger. This is one of the, one of the you know, aisles of many, many aisles at, at Femal Labs Computing Center. Okay, so what's the problem? Well, the problem is that the detectors are complicated and large. You saw that, you know, how large it is. And that means that you need large number of people to work on this. You know, you need a lot of brains to work together. And they're scattered all over the world. You know, not one country can have all these people in them. Okay, so LSC collaborations looks like this. So Atlas has this many countries involved in it. CMS has even more countries involved in it. And Atlas and CMS combined together have over 6,000 physicists and engineers and you know, scattered over 60 countries and 250 institutions. And now, you know, if you in the even the Dune experiment, this is uh, the orange area is where the countries that are involved in Dune experiments are in the world. I would like to see a lot of um, African countries uh, countries start being part of that experiment as well. And it's got over 1,100 collaborators, 184 institutions, 31 countries. But geographically, look at this; they're scattered all over the place here in the world. So you can imagine, oh, here is me and out of the picture. You can imagine, <clears throat> how do we get them communicate quickly and efficiently, despite the fact that they're scattered all over the world? 
And how do we leverage collaborators' capabilities? You know, not only having them in there, but you know, we should be able to take advantage of their intellectual and physical capabilities all over the place. And how do we efficiently utilize all the computing resources? I mean, you know, everybody has powerful computers in your pocket. Your phone is a computer, right? And so, you know, how do we efficiently utilize them so that you know you can actually process all this large amount of data? And data size is getting larger. I mean, it's not just large, it's getting larger. And for LHC experiment alone, it's over 10 petabytes per year, raw data only. And I think it's gonna be even bigger than that. And the entire data set goes over, you know, 15 petabytes, yeah. So where and how do we store the large amount of data? And how do we allow people to do the access of the data to get the physics and science out of the data? in a safe but efficient fashion. And so that people can you know, access the data and study it. So here is the amount of data that is being collected. I mean, you know, important thing is that the scale here is 15 petabytes. It'll cert certainly going to be even bigger. And I think we're gonna go into the hexabyte range soon. So, and then of course, on top of that, how do we allow people's analysis jobs to access data and make progress rapidly and securely? And you know, security becomes even more important. I will talk about it later on, but these technologies has to be done in a safe way in order for it to be useful and helpful for human beings. And what is the most efficient way to get jobs um, requirements matched with resources? These are technical questions that we have to, we have to think about, okay? So how do we also allow you know, experiments to reconstruct data and generate a large amount of simulated events quickly? We cannot just do the data, but we have to understand what the signature of something that we don't quite see regularly um, you know, looks like and how do we do the study of these things and develop our techniques to find them very well. And how do we garner necess necessary computing and storage resources effectively and efficiently? And what network capabilities do we need in the world? Actually, this is something that's, that's you know, to me, absolutely and becoming even more essential to have enough pipelines behind it to provide the, the, the backbone for people to communicate and access and, and benefit from it. So how do we get people to analyze at their desktop? So that was the, that was the, you know, sort of some of the problems that we want to solve even 30 years ago that we, as we started through the uh, LSC. So that's where this grid computing idea came in. So the, that grid, the definition of grid is that the geographically distributed computing resources configured and combined harnessed together for coordinated use. And so physical resources and you know, good network provides hardware capabilities. And of course, there is a software that sits behind it to tie them together, allow people to access them. So this is the idea. And here is, the, here is Ian Foster and, and Chris Kesselman's book that, uh, that started all these grid technologies. So how does a grid computing work? And graphically, uh, you can say, all right, so here is, uh, here is my desktop. And here is uh, here are other you know sub sites that sits behind it, and of course there are big computing sites there, and of course and desktops as well. Okay, so there there is where your analysis jobs will go, and of course then there is uh, you know database you know data distribution management system that sits behind it. This whole thing is in the cloud. You as the an analyzer don't know what's sitting behind it, and you don't have to know that but it actually does the job for you and delivers the output to you in an efficient fashion. That's the idea. So that's why we call cloud system. And this is how the Atlas grid structure is implemented. You started out with a tier zero where you have the data source and this data source is recorded, but then distributed into tier one sites all over the place in the world. And each of these were, you know, countries in tier one sites will also have additional tier two sites where UT Arlington is one of those tier two sites here, which does the you know, grunt work there. Again, okay, so that's the idea that's, uh, that's implemented. And of course now, you know, the, the, the primary reason why developed the, we developed this kind of technology is because we want to look for real particles. So here is how do we look for the real particles and, and the scientific reason behind it. 
So many of these, you know, real particles, not rare particles, real particles are so heavy and they decay into uh, other lighter particles instantaneously as they get produced. So when one, re one searches for a new particle, you look for the easiest way first when you're discovering them, okay, to get at them. So of the many signatures of real particle final states, some are much easier to find than the others. For example, for the standard model Higgs particle, Higgs to gamma gamma final state, two photon final state, or Higgs to ZZ, the, uh, the, the neutral um, you know, weak boson final state, which gives all these leptons in the final state is much easier to look for. Okay, so, so then the way that we do it is in a very simple way, identify Higgs candidate particles like this. Oh, okay, so there are four of these you know, electrons or muons in the final state, and that's the signature of, a, of the Higgs particle that's expected. Then you understand the fakes. Okay, so what are the things that could mimic this thing so that you can mask our signature from it? So we have then understand the, you know, the fakes um, uh, that, that could you know, mask these things. And then we'll look for the bump that sits above that, uh, that fake. So here is, uh, here is you know, the kind of you know, uh, graphical thing that shows, ah, here is my peak here. And here is background and background normally does not give you the peak like this. So you look for a bump here. So now here is what I want you to do. I want you guys to look for the bump in the next picture. And this is showing why it is so important for us to accumulate large amount of data. Statistical effect is absolutely essential for us to uh, find something very rare. Okay, so please pay attention and and identify where the peak is and, and you can type it into the chat as to what mass that peak appears, okay? Here it is, oh, all right, so here you go. Oh no, oh no, okay, before we go. So here is a large amount of LSC data that we have, uh, we have been accumulating you know, yearly every year for as a function of the month. The discovery happened in 2012 and so here is the discovery announcement. And of course, you can see that the amount of data is increasing so high and dramatically every, every year. So that shows the superb performance and our level of understanding. Of course, if we increase the, you know, the, the statistics and the power of the beam, then you can also increase complications like this, where you can have one crossing of the beam bunches. You can have many of the collisions like this. That, that confuses the heck out of people. We have to look for the signature out of that. Okay, so here is the one. So how do we how do we look for the Higgs particle? So here is Higgs to gamma gamma. This is the this is the picture that I would like to pay attention to. Look for the bump. So as we accumulate more data, the bump gets to be more obvious. Of course, it's you know in some sense in untrained eyes, it's not really obvious. Do you see it? Can you type it where where the mass is, where the peak appeared? Let's see if we can do this again. Oh, no, it doesn't want to do it. There, okay, do it again. You see, at the very beginning, you don't see anything appearing at all above the background. But then as we get more data, you see bump appearing even more obvious. There you go. So you see that it's coming down like this as a background and then oop de do here, right there where the mass is. And that's about 125, 126. So with this is uh, this is how we discovered it. So it's um you know the excess of 7, 7.4 statistical significance of 7.4 sigma at the mass of 126 or so. Okay, and that's how we found it. And this is another signal. So Higgs to four um, lepton final state. These are backgrounds. The black, the red ones are background. You can see as we accumulate more and more data, you see the the signal signal to be um, more obvious. Where is it, guys? There you go. You see that right there. That's where it appears, right? So it's six point five sigma. Okay. Now, of course, statistics is important because you know sometimes that uh, as the statistics grows, the signature disappears. So look at this picture, look at this plot. Where do you see a bump? Type in your, your you know, number into the chat. Where do you see the bump?
Hello, everybody. There you go. Yeah, there you go. Rafik typed something in. Anybody else? Yeah, so that's, uh, that's where you see. Huh. There seemed to be something there, about 750 or so. Yeah, okay, so that's, uh, that was you know 760 GB, about 4.6 sigma excess. So that was, that was quite significant. And often in the, long, in the olden times, you know, three to four sigma axis was, uh, was something that, uh, that we could see and an indication. It's no longer. So it's disappeared after four times the data. You see the bump anymore? Nope, you don't see it, right? So as, uh, as statistics grows, you can see that, uh, that, you know, this kind of bump disappearing. So it's absolutely essential for us to have large amount of data, 760 is no longer, okay? So, you know, in order for us to process, take large amount of data, but taking is one thing, but if you can't process it, then it's not gonna help. So the, you know, the, the uh, grid computing was the one that actually sat behind it and provided the computing power for us to do the analysis. So the, uh, the grid computing for LHC sets behind it and provided the computing power to process over you know, close to a million uh, jobs daily so that people can do the analysis real quickly. So this is a uh, you know, data transfer as a function of time. So within, within five hours of the data taking, the data becomes available for people to do the analysis. You know, it's, it's so important for us to be able to get it, get the hand at the data. And this is how much data was used and went through the network at the time of discovery of the Higgs particle here. Right, of course, you know, data, data software, management software has to sit behind it so that it can provide the access to the data. And this is the amount of the data that it was providing. So 25 million jobs completed every month and you know, over hundred sites so, also. And of course, you know, as the time goes on, you know, the opportunistic usage of the um, computing resources that are available uh, harnessed by the grid computing continues to grow like this and it's gonna continue growing over the time, okay? So that's, that's what it did, computing, com computing uh, grid did for high throughput computing that sits behind the scientific world. But as we do, as we did and make that happen and show to the world that it's working and commercial world started picking it up. So early nineties, we were talking about the web technologies and it was developed at CERN, but then 96 starting out with, uh, with Amazon and suddenly everything is exploding like this, right? So, there, so that, you know, the many private entities now fully utilize the internet communication. And of course they have embraced the, um, the cloud technology and cloud technology, they, it's a very nice word. Cloud actually, you know, overshadows everything and it covers the entire world. And I think that's what they do. For example, Zoom that we're using now uses cloud technology, harnessing all the computing resources and the data storage all over the world to provide us this seamless communication between us, okay? And it becomes multi-trillion dollar. And I would say it's going to soon be petrillion dollar uh, you know, economy. And of course the concept of cloud and the high throughput computing not only turned into the commercial area, it also turned into a new area of study and it's called the data science. So we started out using this kind of because we were the one that, that was using huge amount of data generating huge amount of data to look for these, uh, these rare um, uh, phenomena. And of course, then other, you know, this become a, you know, new areas of study. And so you could actually see a lot of universities uh, implementing these data science departments. So now the question that we have to ask is that, okay, so there is high energy particle physics. I told you about the high energy particle physics. Why is the high energy particle physics relevant to me? Well, high energy particle physics explores the most fundamental nature of the universe. That itself is the most important thing for the human race. But then the discovery of the dark matter and making of the dark matter beams will take us to the next quantum level, five times more matter than we can see and we are using now that could be utilized for people. And these discoveries will realize our 1000 year dreams. We have to, we have to think about not just tomorrow, but 1,000 years down, down the road when we do something like this. 
And of course, the outcome and byproduct of high energy physics research improves our daily lives directly and indirectly. We are developing these technologies because we need them to do, to explore the fundamentals of the universe. But then of course, that's, uh, that has a big side effect. For, for example, World Wide Web. So here is a photograph of World Wide Web, uh, you know, the CERN corridor that World Wide Web was developed. These, uh, these are my students who went out uh, to build that uh, prototype detector. Here it is. And of course, advanced detector technologies that we are, we are using, such as gas electron multiplier, will make a large screen, low dosage, X-ray imaging possible. So here is a kind of thing. This is a prototype detector we were developing. It's, this is an X-ray image using that prototype detector um, of, of an object here. Okay, so the wide area, uh, the, uh, the, the less dark area means that there is something. What, can you see what that is? How about this? It's a, it's a rendering of the same thing. Can you see what that is? This is a wrench sitting on it like that. And I had a, I had a you know, um, an x-ray source sitting on top of it to, uh, to give this kind of picture. But this is, this is kind of thing we can do. So are we done with the uh, high, high throughput computing? And you guys probably already guessed, no. The LSC has performed extremely well and the computing infrastructure was built very well behind it. And data size will increase over tenfold in the high luminosity, high power flux um, uh, LSC and computing will be stressed even further. And of course, you know, with this uh, grid computing infrastructure has served as well, very well thus far. And LSC uses process, you know, petabytes of data and billions of jobs. But then of course, soon we will see high intensity experiments such as the Dune experiment to record even larger amount of data than the LSC and we have to process them. And of course, that's, uh, that's gonna require even more computing resources. And so for we've been studying really hard of this high, high throughput computing and let identify the limits in database capability, scalability and CPU resources, storage utilization and stuff like that in technical areas. And they are being addressed and many of them actually, uh, you know, uh, spanning into spin, spanning into new areas. And we also utilize the quantum computing and the machine learning technologies. We are actually working, at, you know, a large number of us are working actively on, on, you know, implementing and utilizing these new technologies. So let me conclude. High energy physics is an exciting endeavor and in understanding the universe. And, you know, that's uh, it alone, that curiosity to understand the universe is very important for us. But in the quest of the, or, you know, searching for the origin of the universe, high energy physics uses accelerator. And that actually already is something that's used everyday lives in, uh, in you know, curing cancer and, and grave diseases and uses large detectors, which can actually turn into a medical devices right off and use large number of computers to process data in the timely fashion and large amount of data get accumulated. And this is actually used everyday lives in commercial world, but at the same time, even in fight for the pandemic, fight against pandemic as well. And physics analysis, uh, you know, at one's desktop using computing grid, uh, you know, sitting behind has happened. The computing grid uses other disciplines. They are being used in other disciplines with large data sets. For example, weather forecast. If you look at the weather forecast these days, they're very precise. I mean, it's amazing actually how fast they came, came so much, pre uh, so, so big of precision. And computing grid fully integrated into everyday life. So pandemic accelerated this process forcefully to us, okay? And a true computing grid is revolutionizing everyday lives. Uh, Christian, there are two more slides that I wanna finish it off. So what's the impact, high energy physics impact to the society? World Wide Web and other advanced computing technologies for high energy physics has gradually reduced the physical distance between us. And in, in, when we were working on this, we were thinking that it's, it will help freeing people, oppressed people and protecting their freedom. I told you where I was coming from on this and that's all coming from my you know, uh, uh, early lives in, in South Korea. 
and keeping people from being imprisoned by their physical limitations or even by a pandemic. And we can actually interact, we can see each other. Okay. And high, both, high throughput computing generates petrillions, and you know, it's a thousand trillion dollars of economy. And I think it will do that soon. And data science becomes a major area of education, as I told you. But all these technologies that can do good things for human beings, however, are instead harmful if used by those lack humanity and fundamental human decency. And we've seen it in the US and, and in everywhere in the world. Okay, so see how spreading misinformation hurts the very humanity that we care and we want to protect. And I think therefore, it's a very important thing that I would like to ask you to guys to be a good person first and with a heart toward the humanity, good of the humanity, not just yourself, not just your own ethnicity, but the entire humanity. That's where we have to go. So in parting message, let's all dream not just dream, not just for tomorrow, not just for the next year, but for the thousand years into the future of the whole humanity. And I think it's very important that we keep this in our mind. Thank you very much. Sorry for it's taking so long. Thank you, Jiaho, for this uh, big two huh, of uh, high energy physics. So do we have any question? We can try. Yes, we can try. We can but try, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm completely aligned with that, definitively. So we have a question from uh, Johan. Hello, he's good afternoon. Um, I wanted to know if high um, energy physics um, deals with big data. And if yes, what are some of the challenges in processing this big data from high energy physics? So, so yes, um, you know, you, you're right. I mean, high energy physics deals with huge amount of data. I mean, you know, I was... okay, well, somebody is getting a call. <laughs> but, but in any case, yes, high energy physics deals with huge amount of data, as I was saying, petabyte and petabytes. And I think we're going to soon go into hexabyte of data. And hexabyte of data is large. And, and therefore, you know, we not only have to have large amount of storage, but also have to have enough computing powers to deal with and to process this data to allow people to get at the secret of the universe. And that's, uh, that's where this, uh, this you know, uh, the, the grid computing infrastructure is working. And of course, you know, harnessing the computing resources, not only for high energy physics field, but for everywhere in the entire world. And, and, this, and, and on top of that, we also are working very hard on, on leveraging the quantum computing, <clears throat> quantum computing technologies uh, to integrate into our data processing as well. And of course, the machine learning as well, so that make the computing uh, resources work smarter. And I think I can soon see that these technologies will turn and come to everyday lives, for example, in autonomous, uh, you know, uh, the vehicles uh, will soon be using this kind of technologies. I don't know if I answered your question, Yuan. I'm pleased you've answered it, thank you. So thank okay. you, and we will have more lecture on this topic of uh, so whether with uh, artificial intelligence, quantum computer, machine learning, deep learning, this is really an important topic, definitely. So starting from the World Wide Web all the way till that. So thanks to physics. So we have questions from Sula. Sula, can you pick up? Oh. Right. Uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. I, I just wanted to find out um, um, what type of um, what type of uh, 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 computing skills would it would you need to be able to to program a, a computing cluster so that you can um, maybe uh, uh, I don't know build a, a tier three a tier three cluster for for, for this collaboration. Okay, that's a that's a very good question. Uh, let me you know um, tell you that I didn't know about computing at all um, uh, when I started out high energy physics, 
and in the in in working on uh, building the detector and uh, and you know uh, working on making sure that we can mo monitor the detector and do the process the data I you know sort of self taught my you know own computing skill which is not a really systematic skill and uh, and you're talking about something more systematic than what I've learned. And and I would say you know for for cluster computing you, you're going to need um, you know more systematic training in the computing engineering and software, and and I think you know the biggest thing these days is uh, is C plus plus and script language based ones, uh, and so uh, so I would say um, those are the ones that will teach you how to um, uh, probably teach you head start. But uh, but you know in order for you to do the cluster computing and uh, and work on these um, very well developed highly technical um, system, I would suggest you to uh, study more systematically in the computing science and engineering. Ketavi, so you had a, a comment or a question, or do we ask uh, so Sahed? Then? Let's go to uh, Sahid first. Sahed, uh, yeah, please go ahead, Sahed. Uh, thank you very much for, for the well-constructed and well-developed presentation. Uh, my question is actually about the uh, LHC and uh, discovery of the X mechanism. So I was wondering, like, uh, why was it that during the times of Hera, Lep, like X, X, X particle was not discovered? And does it have to do with the luminosity and the TEV of the machine? Right. So, um, you know, that's a very good question. Um, there are two factors that are working here. Right. So first of all, you have to, and most importantly, you have to have enough energy in the accelerator to uh, to be able to produce this kind of particle, right? Because the energy conservation works. So you know the accelerator accelerators like um, Hera accelerator it does not have enough energy to reach there. And some of these accelerators could reach there because um, you know they are using these. Um, composite particles and composite particles sometimes could have large amount of uh, energy. For example, Tevatron had enough energy to, to do that, but you don't have, um, you know, you're, you, 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 have, um, you have to have enough uh, intensity to generate those large number of, the, um, number of um, you know, rare uh, particles like Higgs particle. So, so if we were to run, um, a lot longer at uh, at Tevatron, um, then we could have uh, we could have you know found it eventually, but it could have taken a long time. By putting pushing the energy higher and also increasing the intensity at the LHC, that helped us to discover Higgs particle much sooner than it had taken with the lower energy and uh, low intensity accelerators. So yeah, and we'll have tomorrow home. So the statistic uh, analysis as well, of course, that could certainly support everything that you are saying. So another question from uh, maybe Johannes and then uh, Asma. Mm -hmm. So Johannes, go ahead. Please, for uh, our one question. Yeah, you yeah. Have, yeah, okay, but uh, just um, can you speak Janet? you were the next online, otherwise uh, Amza will uh, speak or ask his question. Please come in. Yes, please. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask um, that we had 95% um, of unknown data or mm. unknown universe. So do we have a case where with um, high energy um, physics experiments, we perform experiments and we get unprecedented amount and variety of data. And if we perform such analysis to this unprecedented amount of data to find out if actually um, there's more information about this 95% of known matter in the universe. Okay, so, so you were breaking off about half the time, but I think I, I caught the uh, gist of the question. Um, yes, uh, there were a large number of experiments tried to find these dark matter and understand the dark energy. So we have some of these experiments that are in space that we shoot, um, you know, the satellites up to, to uh, make an observation and study um, the, the dark energy. And of course, we have underground experiments because uh, dark matter is dark because it doesn't interact with uh, electromagnetically, so therefore it doesn't give any light at all. 
So uh, we tried to find them underground and there were a large number of them, but we haven't seen it yet. The thing that I would like to see, my 1,000, one of the, my 1,000 year dreams is to discover it at the accelerator. And by discovering at the accelerator, we can actually make the beams of these particles. And if we can make these beams of these particles, then we can study much better at higher uh, statistics. We are not there yet. We have to first discover. So you guys have huge amount of work and huge amount of exciting endeavor in front of you. That, uh, that you can go and look for some of these 95% of the universe that we haven't seen yet. Good, so Hamza, your question, please. And then Fabian. Hello? Yes? Uh, I have a question about the analysis on the uh, LRC and the uh, other experience. Is it based on CPU or GPU? Because we know that uh, Machine learning, deep learning, or or AI are you, you used uh, often the GPU. Okay. Yes. And the uh, uh, other uh, languages. Okay, so I didn't catch the bottom part, the last part of the question, but I I caught the uh, GPU CPU part of the question. So let me answer that part. So. So, you know, um, GPUs were actually, you know, getting more and more powerful in the in recent years, recent being probably during the past 10 years or less. Before then it was dominated by CPU. So we were actually using CPU as the primary tool for us to process our analysis. But then as the GPUs get uh, more powerful, we started leveraging the, uh, the resources in GPU as well. It's not completely there yet, but it is being used in, in some areas, especially using these, um, these machine learning technology as you were, you were talking about it. Um, and I think it's gonna, it's, gonna get, uh, it's gonna play a more important role as you go along uh, with, uh, with the GPU getting more and more powerful and having more of them actually implemented into a computer. Did I answer the question, Amza? I can't. Yes, thank yeah. you. Um, I would like to suggest that. Uh, Hello, like Prof. To, could you? Uh, I have one question. Yeah, could you ask it in the chat? Because we're getting to the end of the session. Ask your question in the chat, please, all of the people who are there. And Jay, yes. could you just look at the chat and, 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 and answer in the chat? Um, okay. If there's any question there. Um, somebody, okay. somebody needs to mute. Okay, so um, I see. Thank you for the, Okay, that's not it. Um, uh, do, you, do you want me to answer in words as I read uh, this chat? No, 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 no. You can also just type in the chat, but not now. Before, before, before you depart. And uh, okay. So, uh, so you want to you want to wrap up this uh, this session? Okay. That, that, that's right. Yeah. So I would like to. Um, Horse is also connected. Horse, could you? I would like to recognize our uh, horse, uh, Severini, um, as well, um, as well as Jay, um, who are the member of the teams that brought um, grid computing um, uh, session and, and, uh, and analysis uh, to the African School of Physics, as Jay mentioned, the first time in 2012 when we had this school in Ghana. And we have had uh, uh, that sort of hands-on exercises and tutorial in uh, in, in great uh, great computing. And uh, 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 since then, um, the reason why we didn't have it in the online session is because uh, you know it does require hands-on and and uh, and and also uh, um, some you know hardware and software implementation at the venue. Since we are not having an in-person school, we thought uh, that's why we didn't put that especially in the program. Normally, it's a part of our three-week uh, three-week program. Um, so we have been working with Jay and uh, and 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 Horse for a very long time. And as you can see, Jay had uh, served as mentor to African School of Physics uh, alumni, and he has also actually uh, uh, taken some of them. 
as his graduate students. And, and he mentioned the case of uh, Lars Firimenga, who is from uh, Zimbabwe, uh, graduated with PhD uh, under J, and, and Bright Izudike was, uh, is from uh, Nigeria, got the master's. So, so in all of these things, he was able to, uh, you know, do everything that he can to get those uh, alumni to his university and find funding for them and supervise them to PhD and, and, and master's. And uh, he is currently, Jay is currently serving as a mentor for uh, um, Abdel, Abdel Razak, who is now ASP 2020 who is, uh, has been accepted at uh, SMU and going there, starting graduate school. So um, Jay and, uh, and Rose have been intimately involved. Uh, I think all of the people who came and lecturing here are people who have devoted their time and effort to ASP. And you see uh, the wealth of experience and dedication that they are bringing uh to the program and and many of them have also served in the selection committee some of you who are selected we have to rely on all of these people who are lecturing here to actually look through your application and make the selection so it's a huge job without them uh, we won't be able to do it and so i would like to recognize them a horse you are hiding you don't want to turn on your your video so people can see you but i have turned <laughs> my video for a while now is that not coming through uh, I don't. I don't see it. Uh, um, don't see it. Uh, does anybody else see? No, me? I do. We do. I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's fine yeah. now. So that's that's horse and. Uh, yeah, and uh, we're definitely looking forward to seeing everybody again next year. Yeah. Ex yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, Jay, I didn't realize yeah. that you are becoming uh, a fantastic public uh, speaker. So, <laughs> that was really great. <laughs> Thank so, you. Uh, uh, thank you for the for, for 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 the great lecture. I think that was uh, it really uh, was right uh, on the point, and I would like to thank you and uh, and Horst for all of the things that you have done for ASP and that you continue to do for ASP. That's uh, really uh, appreciated. I also I also want to stress again the fact that uh, in, you know in 20, 2014 when we had uh, this school in Senegal, um, Jay. Uh, has secured money from uh, Korean sources for the school. So um, that was uh, very important. So in addition to all of the things I mentioned, so we, we had money for, from Korea at the time, and he's still looking for money for us. So um, yeah, so, so, um, so I would like you, you guys to really acknowledge and appreciate what uh, you know, all of these people are doing, they are not just coming here for an hour or two lectures. Uh, they, they, they are part of the organization and they are doing a whole lot uh, behind the scene for, for ASP to continue and to still be successful. Um, so yeah, Christine, back to you. Yeah, I just uh, copied different questions. So indeed, so the one from Fabian, so I just uh, put it in bracket because he, he didn't maybe had send it to everyone, but I think it's good to have it. Question about Dune. There is another question from Rafik and then another one from uh, Joho so that you will have to answer in writing if you don't mind. So what I will do is that I will leave, I mean, so the video first.